Again, my name's Trey Corey. If I've not had the opportunity to meet you, I'm one of the pastors here at Southwood and grateful to be filling in for Jacob Smith while he's on a sabbatical. So we're gonna be continuing in on our series this morning through the theologies. And this morning, particularly, we're gonna be focusing in on the topic of soteriology, which is the study of salvation. And so as we kind of jump in there, I'll tell you guys what we're gonna do this morning is look at salvation a little bit like a diamond, that in the midst of all of the ologies, all of the kind of categories of theology that we're gonna look at this summer, this is one of the most significant ones. This is the, one of the most meaningful ones. So as we're kind of looking at the calendar, I was like, I, wanna, I want that one. I wanna grab that one for the summer schedule because this is one of the most meaningful to wrestle with what God has done on our behalf and what it means for our lives. As we jump in there, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at salvation a little bit like a diamond this morning, and we're gonna rotate it looking at a series of facets of that diamond so that you and I have a deeper understanding and a deeper appreciation for this diamond that we're gonna refer to as salvation. As we do that, I'm gonna present to you a series of words. For some of you, it may be familiar words. For some of you, it may be new words that kind of refer to and describe each of the facets of this diamond. And as we do that, you might need to know that as it comes to new words and fancy new words, I have a bit of a complicated relationship with new words today. You see, I'm, I'm a father of an incoming seventh grader, which means this, that every single week in our lives and in our home, my daughter is bringing home to me a series of new words that describe essentially whether someone or something is good or bad. They're fancy new words, and I'll just tell you that, that they come in every single week, and in the midst of them, I would try to help highlight to you all the new words that I know that the kids say today. Uh, but my uh, soon-to-be teenage daughter has explicitly forbidden me from using any of these words in public. Do it anyway. <laughs> so if I were to do it, I would make myself an idiot and her, her entire family an idiot, so I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna ask you that you would trust me this morning. But in the midst of some of the new words we're gonna hit this morning, my hope for you is that your experience of them as we walk them out this morning is not like the father of a teenage daughter, all right? My hope is that you feel like you're able to understand these words and that you feel explicit permission, even exhortation, to walk out of here this morning and to feel the freedom to use these words. In fact, that's where we're gonna end this morning, is an exhortation for you to use these words as we think about the hope that we have that we communicate to the communities that we find ourselves in and where the Lord's put us. But ultimately, again, we're gonna walk through the idea of salvation, and as we do that, what I wanna highlight for us is a series of facets to this diamond known as salvation. In order for us to jump in, what would be helpful is to give you guys a reminder of where we were last week. Last week, we looked at the topic of anthropology or the study of humanity, its origins, its nature, how God designed us, what were God's purposes for us. And as we did that, we recognized that God created humanity as the pinnacle of his creation, that he created humanity in the image of God to bear the glory of God to represent God in the midst of the kingdom that has been established in the midst of the creation that he placed humanity squarely within. But as we wrapped up last week, we recognized that although God was creating humanity at the pinnacle of his creation as the unique image bearers that can represent his glory and bear his glory, sin entered the picture. Sin entered the picture and it disgraced the beauty of the creation, not just of all of the creation, but even of humanity, so that now humanity doesn't represent God as they should. Humanity doesn't bear God's glory as they should, that there is a marred, like graffiti on art, a reality about humanity, which sets the stage for our topic this morning in terms of the salvation of man. What does it mean when we talk about the salvation of man? Simply put, I wanna begin this morning by giving us kind of a baseline definition of what does salvation mean? If you look it up in Webster's real quick, what you'll find from this idea of salvation, it means to preserve or to rescue from danger or harm. We use the idea of to save or salvation in all kinds of contexts today. We use it all the time. This past week, my Dallas Mavericks were down 0-3 against the Golden State Warriors looking for a miracle to be the only team to come back from an 0-3 deficit. It didn't happen. So I don't have a game seven to watch this afternoon and it's fine, all right? But all of single, every single one of us finds ourselves in situations in which we feel the need for rescue. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's health, maybe it's circumstantial, maybe it's relational that every single one of us has found ourselves in situations in which we would use the word salvation or to be saved in a normative, plain sense. In fact, even as we look at the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, we see the scriptures use the word salvation in a wide range of meanings. I'm gonna highlight just very specifically a few, even in the New Testament, to highlight the use of the word salvation in a very plain, physical sense. Matthew chapter 14, verses 29 to 30 the impetuous Peter gets out of the boat and begins to walk on water and he sees the wind and he becomes frightened and he begins to sink and he cries out, Lord, save me. 
The very plain understanding is, look, the wind is about to whip around. I'm about to sink in the water. I need you to intervene for my physical safety. Matthew chapter 9, you get another passage along these lines in which we see this idea of physical salvation. Matthew chapter 9, a woman has been suffering from a hemorrhage for about 12 years. She comes and she touches the cloak of Jesus. Jesus, sensing that power has moved out from him, he turns to see who's touched him and he says to the woman, your faith has made you well. He's referencing a physical deliverance that's occurred for her related to her disease and her illness, her hemorrhage. In these two passages in Matthew, uh, in the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, we see examples of physical salvation. I'm gonna give you guys an example as we think, as, we, as you know where we're gonna go in terms of the topic of spiritual salvation. So what does it mean to be saved spiritually? If that's what it looks like to be saved physically, what does spiritual salvation look like? This is where we're gonna kind of focus in on our morning to kind of create a baseline definition of what we mean by salvation. Kind of the most core, critical, foundational passage is gonna be Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine, in which Paul tells us this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine provide us one of the clearest passages as we begin to understand what salvation looks like spiritually and how it occurs. What the Apostle Paul is telling us in Ephesians chapter two is that in order for us to be rescued from spiritual danger, it's going to occur as a gift, meaning you and I are not gonna have to pay for anything that allowed this, this gift to be provided, and you and I are not gonna have the ability to do works in order to earn that gift. That gift is gonna come on the basis of Christ's work himself, not on the basis of our works, which is why Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine really create this great contrast between faith and work that in order to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, in order to have a reconciled relationship with the creator God, it is not on the basis of what we can merit and on the basis of what we can earn. It's not on the basis of what we do. Paul is telling us in Ephesians chapter two, the ability to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, the ability to be saved from spiritual death and spiritual danger is an absolutely free gift that the God of the universe has provided for us through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul will say in Acts chapter four, verse 12, we find this, that uh, there is no other name under heaven that has been given by which we must be saved. That not only is our faith contrary to works, but the faith that we possess is a faith that is provided in the person of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Simply put, what these two passages are helping to find for us as we begin our, our, our time together this morning is this, that you and I are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This is the great uh, proclamation of the Reformation, uh, that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we cannot earn or merit our approval before God, that is God's gotta intervene and do something on our behalf for us. Therefore, it is going to be by grace that God is going to give us something that we could not merit. He's going to give it to us as a gift, and it's going to be through the person of Jesus Christ alone, and there is no salvation in any other name than Jesus Christ. That sets us up for a baseline understanding of what we mean by salvation. This diamond in terms of salvation and how God has intervened on man's behalf to rescue us from spiritual death and spiritual calamity. And kind of as we walk that through, what I wanna give you is a sense of kind of as we think about the recipients, well, who gets this great gift? There's kind of two extremes in our day and time, in our culture today. Two different extremes that kind of look at, well, who receives this great gift of salvation? On one end of the spectrum are those that are known as universalists. They will say all will be saved, that God is forgiving, God is loving, God doesn't wish any to perish, so he will save all people. As we look through the scriptures, though, it would seem that that is a fantasy, an unreliable fantasy. On the other end of the spectrum are those that are atheists who don't believe there is a God, therefore they don't believe that man needs salvation, and so they would argue that none will be saved, which is an unimaginable tragedy. So between these two different extremes, as we think about who receives this great gift, of salvation, there's universalism that's a fantasy on one extreme, there's atheism that's a tragedy on the other extreme, and smack dab in between them is the idea of the Christian gospel and the Christian understanding of salvation. That we're saved by grace alone and faith alone by the person of Jesus Christ alone. As we talk about salvation, that's the basic core kind of premise and idea that we're gonna unpack and then begin to kind of look at the multiple facets of this diamond. What I wanna do is kind of give you five words or five facets of this diamond to kind of begin to unpack 
and explain exactly how Christ has done that and exactly why this gift forgives us of our sins and grants us eternal life. How do we get here? Five different words. We're gonna begin with the first word, which is atonement. The first idea that we're gonna talk about as we think about this great gift of salvation is the idea of atonement. This simply means this, to cover over an offense or to take care of sin so that God doesn't punish it. The first couple words I'm gonna give you this morning, beginning with atonement, are gonna be ideas of what we've been saved from, and then we're gonna talk a little bit later on about what we've been saved to. But the first thing that we've been saved from is this idea that God is going to cover over our offense. He's going to take care of our sin so that God doesn't have to punish it. That idea really comes from the Old Testament. As we think about Leviticus chapter 16, that in the day of atonement for the nation of Israel, there was a day once a year in which the, the, the punishment or which the guilt of the nation of Israel's sins were going to be transferred and placed on animals. Those animals would be slaughtered and the high priest would take the slaughtered blood of those animals for whom the nation of Israel's guilt had been placed upon. They would slaughter those animals and then he would take the blood of those animals and he would sprinkle it within the Holy of Holies on the, on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. I'm gonna give you a picture here. So once a year, the, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement only once a year. And only one person could enter the Holy of Holies. And he would take the slaughtered blood of the animals for whom the nation of Israel's guilt had been placed upon them. And he would take that blood and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat, which is at the top of this ark. Such that when God looked down upon the nation of Israel, he would see the shed blood that was a covering over their sin. So that his wrath would turn away. And he could deal with the nation of Israel in kindness and in love and in truth. As we think about that concept, the Old Testament reality, the Old Testament practice of atonement, the day of atonement kind of highlighted two different concepts. One was the sinfulness of man. And the second is the holiness of God. That what it taught the nation of Israel, this picture, this symbol, this practice, this reality was that the nation of Israel and all of humanity was ultimately and profoundly sinful. And that their sin had dire consequences that were grave, that forced and necessitated the death of something. That someone had to die for their sins to be dealt with. That's what atonement was teaching them. In fact, as you look at Hebrews chapter nine this morning, I want you to flip over, if you can, to Hebrews chapter nine. What we're gonna see is that the day of atonement was a picture that was teaching them not just about the depravity of man, but also about the holiness of God. And year after year, the high priest would have to slaughter new animals, and year after year, they'd have to reapply blood onto the mercy seat because the blood would flake away. And so it never was adequate enough. It never was ultimately sufficient for what God desired and what God needed to do ultimately, most profoundly, for the nation. And so in Hebrews chapter nine, the writer of Hebrews, knowing and understanding the background of atonement, comes in the nation and, they say, and tells them, tells uh, the early church this, thinking about what Christ has done as he ultimately will fulfill and surpass atonement. Notice in Hebrews chapter nine, picking up in verse 11 with me, if you'll follow along, we find this. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Follow, if you will, follow with me, if you will, a little bit further down into verse 25. It says, nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he's been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. What the writer of Hebrews is telling us in, in Hebrews chapter nine and even a little bit into verse, in chapter 10 is this, that atonement in the Old Testament was a reality and a yearly practice that they had to go through year after year after year. The high priest entering one year after another year after another year, slaughtering a new set of animals, reapplying blood that kept flaking off because ultimately it was a picture that there was a sacrifice that was going to be necessary that would ultimately take care of this in a way that the blood of animals, bulls and goats can never do. 
For the writer of Hebrews says, if the blood of bulls and goats could sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will a perfect sacrifice do? The writer of Hebrews is helping us realize that the idea of atonement, a covering over, is something that Christ comes and fulfills and surpasses for us. Imagine, if you will, for a moment that you have a picture of yourself that you like, but there's some blemishes or there's some imperfections on your face. Today, because of filters, you can put a filter over it and you can cause the picture to be such that you, in a sense, cover over that blemish and that inadequacy. What atonement was, was a covering over of those blemishes and inadequacies to a day and time in which Christ would finally deal with it once and for all. But it was meant to prime and it was meant to teach the nation of Israel and us that because of our sin, a death would have to be made. And ultimately, the bulls and goats could cover year after year, but it was not adequate enough to ultimately handle it once and for all until a perfect sacrifice came and handled it once and for all, which was Jesus. The idea of atonement sets up the stage for another word that we often don't use, but that's the word of propitiation, uh, which simply means to turn away or to satisfy the wrath of God. This is the second word, and propitiation is directly connected to this idea of atonement. In order for God to, in a sense, cover over, a time was going to come when he would no longer cover over, but he would deal with most profoundly. And in order for the wrath of God to be turned away with, it have to be dealt with, it would have to be satisfied. And so what we find in in, uh, Romans chapter three, verses 25 to 26, is this idea of propitiation. Notice what Paul says in Romans three. Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because he passed over the sins previously committed so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What Paul is saying in Romans chapter three, he's using a word we often don't use and it's probably one of the most unfamiliar words you're gonna get this morning as we kind of walk through this, is the idea that ultimately in order for God to save us, his wrath and his anger would need to be poured out and ultimately satisfied somehow, some way. And the idea of propitiation is this, that God pours out his, all of his wrath upon Jesus Christ, who takes the penalty for our sins upon himself so that his wrath is ultimately satisfied because it's poured out. Wayne Grudem says it this way, kind of summarizing what we mean here by propitiation. He says, at the cross, the fury of all that stored up wrath against sin was unleashed against God's own son. It means that there is an eternal and unchangeable requirement in the holiness and justice of God that sin must be paid for. As we think about these ideas of atonement and propitiation, they go together in two different ways. One, saying that, there's a, there, that humanity is sinful and they're depraved, and because of their sin, there has to be a payment that is enacted by a holy God. That holy God, if he does not get that wrath satisfied, if that payment is not made, then he cannot remain just unless that payment is satisfied. And so what we get in this idea of atonement and propitiation is this idea that God's wrath against sin, against the depravity of man is kindled and it's poured out not on man, but on a substitute and a more perfect sacrifice, Jesus himself, who can represent humanity as as one who is in the flesh, but also who can represent and satisfy the wrath of God as him who is also God in the flesh. And so as all of God's anger and wrath is kindled and poured out on a substitute, finally, once and for all, God's anger and his wrath is satisfied and dealt with by a sacrifice that doesn't have to continue to be re-offered, but is offered once for all, final time. Because it satisfies the holy requirement of a holy God. Really, when you think about our culture today, what often ends up happening is we diminish our sense of man's depravity and we diminish the sense of God's holiness. Let me put it like this from a quote from Niebuhr who speaks of liberal theology. He says that often what's being told to us is that there's a God that is without wrath, that's brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. What he's trying to say here as we think about other theology in our culture today is this, that if we can diminish the depravity of man, we don't have a problem with a holy God. Therefore, we don't need a salvation with an ultimate cost like a God-man that is sacrificed once and for all for us. But if we can diminish sin, we can therefore diminish the holy offense of a holy God, and therefore we don't need such a great costly sacrifice of a God-man who's put on a cross to satisfy the wrath and the holy payment of a God for sin. 
And honestly, as I was thinking through this and was rolling through prep this week, this is a concept that really kind of stopped me in my tracks, thinking afresh about this idea, because I think for every single one of us, we have a casual view of our sin, and it is an offense to God. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, much of what you hear in our media today, much of what you hear in our culture today is that humanity is basically good. That if you'll try really hard, if you'll do enough good things, if you'll make a positive contribution in culture and society, then God will be pleased with you if there is a God and you'll be saved. What the scriptures are saying is something very different than that. That humanity is depraved, that humanity is hostile to God. Because of that sin, we've been separated from God. And the only way that separation can be dealt with is if God enacts a perfect sacrifice and a perfect payment for our sins that we see as a substitute placed upon a holy God, Jesus Christ, for us. But often if we think about it, if, if we don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we think we, maybe, maybe our sins are not that bad. Maybe we don't need that big of a sacrifice paid for us. Maybe we can kind of work our way to appeasing God himself. Or maybe we have a relationship with God. This morning, we, we've entered into a relationship with God maybe a long time ago through, the, through faith and the re- death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But maybe especially for us, we struggle realizing that our sin is that big of a deal. I mean, Christ paid for it, right? Christ has already dealt with the consequences for that sin. It's not that big of a deal now. We treat grace like a credit card. We keep maxing it out. We keep charging to it because it's not that big of a deal if I keep falling to this or I keep falling to that. And one of the things I was thinking through this this week, kind of wrestling with some of these ideas, is that part of what we see in salvation is that our depravity and our sin is a big deal. It's an offense to a holy God, and we don't grasp that, and we so quickly and we so often diminish it. For many of us, there's things that we're struggling with, and we treat them like we can manage them. Like we'll just kind of keep them right here, and we can manage it, and we can control it, and it won't get the best of us. Some years ago, we were on a vacation and we were in Yellowstone and my family and I were looking for a bear and a moose and we went all day in Yellowstone and saw nothing. And so we're driving home and we park at a place for dinner and we're at a pizza place kind of on the edge of uh, the park. And as we're there in the parking lot, we look down and we finally see a moose at the end of the day, okay? Been in the park all day, nothing. We show up to a dinner place and there's a moose walking through civilization. It was the most stunning moment we'd ever had, all right? And so we do what any wide-eyed, idiotic tourist does in these settings. We grab our precious children and we go straight towards the moose, okay? And so my, in, my boy at the time was like six months, so he stays in his chai chair, but I grab my three-year-old daughter, I put her up on my shoulders, and we start walking towards the moose with 15 of our other closest friends at this point in time. And so we're walking and the moose is going through the field, but eventually we begin to kind of meet the moose at a place where he, he basically has come up against a building. So on one side of the moose is a building and then the other side of the moose are 15 of my now closest friends and we've surrounded the moose. Now, in the midst of that moment, I'm not really thinking that this is that big of a deal because I'm taking pictures. Uh, this is from afar. I have other ones that are closer up. Uh, and I'm also thinking, you know what? There's people that are a lot closer to the moose than me. So if this goes south, they're gonna get caught, not me, Right? Real smart plan, right? And then all of a sudden, as we get closer and closer and closer, all of a sudden the moose feels trapped and he makes out a crazy bellowing sound and he lowers his head and he goes charging. And so I do what all I can think to do is I just turn pivot and I start running as fast as I possibly can back up the hill. Now keep in mind, I have my three-year-old on my shoulders who does not have any ab muscles yet. And so instead of staying propped up, and like standing up, she's just flapping like backwards, like back to back, like her head's this way, and I'm just running to save her and my life at this point in time, okay? We get out, we're fine, There's no scars, just good stories, okay? But it was a moment where I thought, man, what was I doing? Why did I get lulled into thinking that this was not a dangerous situation? Why did I think that if others were closer, if others were closer to the fire, that I wouldn't get burnt, Right? Why do I begin to think that in the midst of my life that my sin is not that big of a deal, that I can manage it, I can deal with it, it won't get the best of me? Walking through some of these ideas this week, one of the things the Lord kind of did was he goes, no, no, your sin is an offense to me. I'm a holy God and it is a big deal. And your cavalier managing it like it's a pet that you can control is a very dangerous dynamic. Our proper response to sin is to confess and to run away. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, chapter 22, flee from youthful lust. 
The verbs in response to sin are often either confess and then it's turn and run, it's flee. It's not contain a close proximity to just enough to be out of the fire, right? One of the things I wanna challenge us as we think about what God's accomplished for us in our salvation is that our sin is a big deal. That it was such a big deal that in order for us to be saved and be rescued from that spiritual danger of sin and its consequences, a holy God had to die for us. The father had to send his son, the God man, into the world and he had to live a perfect life and then die in our place. That gift of salvation comes absolutely freely, but it came at incredible cost to him. And I think for us, it's not just our culture, but even for us, even within the church, we get to a place where we diminish the severity of sin as if it's not that big deal and as if we can manage it. As we continue on this morning, I just simply wanna say, to kind of stop in the middle of this morning to say, hey, in the midst of what we see of what God had to do and the measures that God had to go to to deal with our sin, then you and I need to wake up, whether we've entered into a relationship with him yet or not. That sin will destroy, that sin will wreak havoc, that sin wants to still kill and destroy, and so you and I have to wake up and we have to be alert and we can't realize, we can't believe that we can manage it and be okay. These first two words kind of help us realize what God has saved us from, that God has saved us from his wrath and his anger that's been kindled against sin, and he's dealt with it so that he's atoned for and he's propitiated for our sin. The third thing we're gonna see is that ultimately as well, what has it saved us to since his wrath has been dealt with, and what does it mean that we've been saved to? What do we get to experience? What ends up happening now? What we're gonna see here in Romans chapter five and Romans chapter eight is that we have now also been reconciled to God. That because of his wrath being dealt with, we now can be reconciled back into a relationship with the creator God who created us and who loved us. Romans chapter five says, uh, beginning in verse one, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He continues on in Romans chapter eight and he says, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son and you have received a spirit of adoption as sons that we are children of God and heirs also. I tried to bold and I tried to italicize the the words that choose, kind of the nouns that describe us, because notice what it means for us to be reconciled. It's not just that God's wrath has been dealt with, but we went from being strangers and excluded to now being included. Thinking of where we were last week, thinking about the fact that God has created humanity, his image bearers, and placed them in his creation, what we find this morning is it's not just that we are a unique part of his creation, but he desires us to be family that we're not just a creature, that we're designed for an intimate, personal, unique relationship with the creator God of the universe as a family member, that he didn't just save us from danger, but he brought us into his family. I don't know about you, but thinking of a seventh grader about to be, or a kid going into seventh grade, for me, one of the biggest questions was about belonging, a place to belong, a place to be known, a place to be accepted. And one of the most powerful things I think about salvation and what's been secured for us are these ideas of reconciliation. That we've been brought into a family, that we belong, that we're accepted by the creator God of the universe in a way that pales in comparison to whatever anyone else may say. I love this idea that we have been reconciled. And I started here more so than the next term of justification because we spend so much time often talking about justification especially being in an academic, engineering kind of town that has an emphasis as a Bible church on often Pauline epistles. We spend a lot of time thinking about justification. I'll talk about that here in a minute. But I think, frankly, the more powerful term, if we think about it, is the term of reconciliation. That in terms of what God has accomplished for us, it's a relational term. It's a relational idea. That we've been brought back into a relationship. Then the fourth word that we're gonna give you guys this morning is the word justification. So what does that mean? That if we've been saved from the wrath of God, and if we've been reconciled relationally to the God of the universe, then we've also been justified. To justify means to declare somebody righteous, that relational and legal obligations are met. We get this in Romans chapter three, verse 21, when Paul says this, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, being justified as a gift by his grace. Reconciliation is a relational term, Justification is a legal term. 
both are terms that kind of refer to status, all right? So when we talk about being justified, what we're imagining is the, uh, a courtroom proceedings in which accusations have been brought against humanity, and the judge stands up and he says, look, based off what Jesus Christ has done, I now declare them to be innocent. The payment for that sin, for that violation has been enacted over here. Therefore, I can declare this one innocent or righteous. Does it mean that we actually are righteous? No. It means that we've been declared righteous, that our status as those of in the court, as those that now see the court would now see us as innocent or righteous. We're gonna talk next week about the topic of sanctification, which is the process by which we are made righteous, but what justification is, is a moment in time in which we place our faith in Jesus Christ, and at that moment, we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And at that moment, God then looks upon us and declares that we are righteous, that we're justified. Justification is an event in in time that occurs at the moment that we trust Christ. Sanctification is a process in which we are made righteous. Justification is our status as those who are now seen as righteous. Sanctification is going to be the process in which we are now made righteous. All right, that's where we're gonna go next week. But this is a giant term, this is a giant significant one as Paul walks us through this in terms of the Old Testament. Not only could the blood of bulls and goats not ultimately forgive us of our sins, but what Paul is saying is that the Old Testament law could never justify a man. That what the Old Testament law could do was like a ruler shed, uh, since a measurement upon our sin, but it could never actually declare us righteous and just. What justification is is the moment in time which God looks upon us and declares that we are righteous, that we're innocent, that the debt and the accusations against us are now wiped out and our record is clean. It's a legal term. Reconciliation is a relational term. Justification is a legal term. And then lastly, uh, redemption is an economic term, all right? This is the last word for us this morning, all right? So hang with me. We're getting to the finish line. Last term here is the idea of redemption. And the idea is that it would be one who would buy a slave out of the marketplace. So reconciliation is relational. Justification is legal. And this last one, redemption, is economic. And the concept is this that a slave is brought to the, uh, to the marketplace and someone would come and purchase that slave out of the market to bring about freedom for the slave. What we find in the New Testament over and over again from the Gospels to the book of Revelation is that we talk about the fact that we've been bought with a price, that Christ has bought us out of the marketplace so that we're no longer slaves but we're free. Revelation chapter five says it this way as we think about the end of human history, the climax of human history, the book of Revelation says this, that worthy are you to, break, to, to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, and people and nation. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he, he references this and he begins to draw implications on the future and on, the, uh, on life. He says, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. What we see in this idea of redemption, again, is an economic term. And what it's trying to say is this, that you and I are slaves. We're slaves to sin and we're slaves to the devil. We're slaves to the world. And what Jesus Christ has done through his blood is he's bought us, he's purchased us out of the marketplace so that we're no longer slaves, but we're free. And if we're no longer slaves, but we're free from sin and death, then the implications will be then, therefore, how ought we to live? If we've been bought out of slavery, then why do we continue to live as slaves at times? That's where we're gonna go next week looking at the idea of sanctification and therefore, how do we live? Five words, five facets of a diamond that we've tried to look at this morning. I'm gonna give you a quick summary of them just in case you're trying to figure out where we've been. Atonement propitiation, the idea that we've been saved from the wrath of God, that the wrath of God has been poured out and it's been satisfied based off the shed blood of Jesus Christ. A death had to occur. And because that death had to occur and because we believed in Jesus Christ, we have now been reconciled, relationally reunited. We've been justified, legally declared righteous. And lastly, we've been redeemed, economically bought out of slavery. But as we walk through our scriptures, they're giving us all these different ideas, all these different angles on this great concept of salvation. Why? Because it's so meaningful and it's so profound that you and I are not to understand it with just one angle and one glimpse and one lens, but we're to understand it, and it's multi-varied ideas. In fact, one of the things I wanna ask you this morning as we think about these words is, uh, which are the ones that you're the most comfortable with? When you walked in this morning, which of these five do you go, hey, I could have said that word and I could have defined it? Which of these words would you say, hey, I've never heard that word before? 
and I'm still not 100% sure what it means. And here's why. As we think about what we're gonna go and do and how we therefore go and live in light of this reality, a couple of ideas I'm gonna have for you are this. One is if you don't know Jesus Christ, today's a perfect day grasping exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us to believe. Recognizing that we all have a sin problem and, and recognizing that Jesus Christ has dealt with that sin problem in a way that no one else could. That he's paid the penalty for our sins. He's paid the death that should have been ours so that we could be redeemed and forgiven. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, today's a great day to do that. Our staff will be here immediately following the service and if you have questions and you wanna talk, we'd love to engage with you. We'd love to wrestle with you in terms of questions you may still have about who Jesus is and about what Jesus has done. For those of us who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would challenge us that we, those that have embraced and received this gift should be those that are out there sharing and speaking of this great gift of what's been accomplished for us. And one of the things I've realized through the years is that I typically will share of the hope that I have or the gospel in the same kind of ways over and over and over again. As a former engineer that came through here at a as a computer engineering major, I kind of lean toward a Pauline kind of justification legal idea. Maybe I just like crime shows as well. I don't know what it is. But I would always kind of just share the gospel in a very legal-oriented way from guilt to innocence. But the beauty of the scriptures is they show this gift of salvation in a whole host of ways. And yet typically when I speak of it, I would speak of it only in certain kind of ways. So why does the scriptures provide it in so many different ways? I think it's because different images, different facets of the diamond communicate and resonate with different people in different ways. I'm an engineering guy that likes crime shows. Innocence and guilt are ways that I think and it makes sense to me. So many cultures are not individualistic, but they're relational. And so the idea of a God that would look upon humanity and want a relationship with them and want to build a community of the church together communicates really significantly to people. And so one of the things I want to challenge you to do this week as you kind of walk away from here and think about these five ideas is simply this. I want you to identify one of the words here that is for you the least familiar and the least common. And I want to challenge you and encourage you to think about how could you share the gospel in light of that truth and in light of that reality. What would it look like for you to do that? Begin to think of the gospel and portraying the faith and the hope that we have in a way that's not as familiar and normal for us. The last thing we wanna do this morning is just simply think about that gift that we received. And we wanna give you guys some time before the Lord just to come before the Lord and to worship and to have the opportunity to express gratitude and appreciation for what has been secured for us that the God of the universe would not just create to us, but in the midst of our own sin and separation that would ensue, that he would send his own son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. As a recipient of the wrath of God that would be ushered away from us so that we could be reconciled, justified, and redeemed. We wanna give you an opportunity this morning to come before the Lord and to express a deeper appreciation for what he's done, to have the opportunity to respond in worship in light of what he's accomplished for us. And so let me pray for us, and then the band's gonna come up, and they're gonna lead us as we close out this morning.